designing slaughterhouses across the United States. And the reason she can do that, as far as she's concerned, is because she thinks like an animal thinks. And there was a Coke can sitting in the middle of the pathway, and the cows would all stop because they didn't know what to do with it. Your standard house, like a pentagon, right, which is basically how children draw the front of a house with a steeple on top and maybe a cross on top of it or something like that, which actually isn't at church. Really? It looks nothing like a person, right? You immediately recognize it as a person, but it looks nothing like a person. There's things you can't see or hear even if you need to, because we're mobile creatures. We're navigating through it, attempting to make the world manifest itself in accordance with our wishes. Now, here's something interesting. I went and saw an autistic woman speak at one point. Her name was Temple Grandin. She's really worth looking up. Temple Grandin is a very interesting person. She's very seriously autistic when she was a child, but her mother and her worked her out of it so that she's very functional. She works as a professor. I don't remember where, it's in the Midwest somewhere. Now, she's famous not only for being a highly functional autistic person who talks a fair bit about what it's like to be autistic, but also for designing slaughterhouses across the United States. And the reason she can do that, as far as she's concerned, is because she thinks like an animal thinks. She's identified maybe at least part of what the core problem is with autism. So the talk I heard her at was in Arizona, and it, it was a really an entrancing talk. She showed some really interesting pictures of animals. So what she's done is she's redesigned slaughterhouses so that when the animals enter the slaughterhouse, they go in a, like a spiral, basically. They can't see what's around the corner, and the walls are high so they're not distracted by anything outside. So one of the things she showed, for example, was a bunch of cows going through a standard gates, essentially. And off to the side, there was a windmill spinning, and the cows would stop because the windmill, they didn't understand what the windmill was, and they'd stop. Or showed other pictures where the cows were going down a pathway too, and there was a Coke can sitting in the middle of the pathway, and the cows would all stop because they didn't know what to do with it. Or she had another picture of cows out in the middle of the field, all surrounding a briefcase, and they were all looking at the briefcase. And the cows didn't like anything that shouldn't be there and had a hard time mapping it. Now she said, here's a little exercise she did, she said, think of a church. Imagine a child's drawing of a church, eh? It's like your standard house, like a pentagon, right? Which is basically how children draw the front of a house with a steeple on top and maybe a cross on top of it or something like that, which actually isn't at church. It's an icon of a church. And you think about how children draw houses too. Pentagon, rectangle, what is it, trapezoid, chimney, almost always with smoke, which is quite interesting. I don't know where kids get that exactly, but they almost always draw a chimney with smoke, even though chimneys with smoke aren't that common anymore. But anyways, you can see what a child's picture of a house looks like in your imagination. One of the things that you might want to think about is that is not a picture of a house at all. It's an iconic representation that's kind of like a hieroglyph. Because no house looks like that. And then you think about how a child will draw a person. Circle, stick. And you show it to someone and they go, that's a person. Really? It looks nothing like a person, right? You immediately recognize it as a person, but it looks nothing like a person. What Grandin said was that when she thinks of a church, she has to think of a church she's seen. She can't take the set of all churches and abstract out an iconic representation and use that to represent the set of all churches. She gets fixated on a specific exemplar. And she thinks that one of the problems with autistic people, and they have a very difficult time developing language, by the way, is that they can't abstract out generalized representation across a set of entities. They can't abstract. And of course, if you can't abstract, then it's also very difficult to manipulate the abstractions. And you see very strange behavior with autistic children, for example, so they don't like people. And that's because people don't stay in their perceptual boxes. Like a human being is a very difficult thing to perceive because we're always shifting around and moving and doing different things. Like we don't stay in our categorical box. So autistic people have real trouble with other people. But also, for example, if your autistic child gets accustomed to your kitchen, let's say, and you move a chair, then especially if they're severely autistic, they'll have an absolute fit about it. Because you think kitchen with chair moved, they think completely different place. Because they can't abstract the constancies across the different situations and represent them abstractly. Everything is made out of littler things and those littler things are made out of littler things and so forth. And those things are nested inside bigger things and so forth. And 
where you perceive on that level of abstraction is somewhat arbitrary. It has to be bounded by your goals. That's the other thing, is that your perceptual structures are determined by the goals that you have at hand. Some of that's not completely true because your perceptual systems also have limitations, right? There's things you can't see or hear even if you need to. So there are limitations built in, but within that set of limitations, you're still trying to tune your perceptions to your motivated goals. And that's also very useful to think about when you're trying to understand artificial intelligence because for human beings without goals there's no perception because there's no filtering mechanism that you can use to determine the level of resolution at which you perceive so the first issue is how should you look at things that's a problem that intelligence has to solve so that's one of the problems that intelligence goes after and then I think what happens is we have the thing in itself and then we simplify it with a perception and that's like a, an iconic representation and then we nail the iconic representation with a word and that's how we compress the world's complexity into something that we can manage we take the complex thing make it into an icon and represent the icon with a word and then when I throw you the word so to speak you decompose it into the icon and then decompose it even further into the thing if you can't if you know the icon and you know the thing and so then we can use shorthand right because you have representational structures and so do I and I'm just tossing you markers about your representational structures and you can unfold them that's what you do when you're reading a novel because the novel comes alive in your imagination in your own idiosyncratic way and it wouldn't if you didn't understand the references of the novel. The novelist has to assume that your basic perceptual structures and your intuitions and your instincts are basically the same as his or hers. It's problematic often. For example, if you start reading Victorian novels, you may find that it takes a while to get into them because the presuppositions, the expectations are slightly different and so is the language. You have to update the representations. But Anyway, so that's roughly, as far as I'm concerned, that's roughly a representation of what intelligence is doing in the world, it's, or a big part of it. It's how in the world do you look at things so that you can use them for the purposes that you need to use them for. And then the next problem that intelligence has to solve, which is related, is once you've got the perceptual landscape sorted out, how do you abstractly represent the action patterns that you're going to implement in the world? So it's... How do you perceive where you are now? How do you perceive where you're going? And how do you construct up and then implement strategies that enable you to move from where you are to where you're going? So it's a continual process of mapping and movement. And so it's navigation. That's what we're doing in the world all the time, is navigating through it because we're mobile creatures. We're navigating through it attempting to make the world manifest itself in accordance with our wishes. And that's the fundamental problem that intelligence has to solve. And animals have their perceptions to rely on, but we have our perceptions and our ability to abstract from those perceptions multiple times and then to abstract finally into language. So we live in a very abstracted world. And it also means that we can learn a lesson in one place and generalize it across many other places, which is also something that animals have a hard time doing because they don't know how to do that perceptual, initial perceptual generalization.